Uh, my parents were both born in Japan. Uh, they came, my father came in 1918, my mother came about 1921. And <clears throat> I was born in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, California, it was called, um, in 1934. My father had started out to become a publisher and a writer, and he had majored in the Chinese classics at university in uh, Japan and he was going to be a scholar and publisher. Well, that didn't happen. And so he eventually figured out that being a migrant worker, which is what he did for three years in the United States, was not uh, very satisfactory either, but that was the only kind of uh, employment he could find. And he decided he would go to Mexico when he found out that he couldn't own land here in the United States. So he started after being a migrant farmer in Northern California, got as far as um, Ventura County in Oxnard, <clears throat> and he decided he'd better learn how to speak Spanish. And he found a uh, Catholic priest, Mexican, who agreed to teach him Spanish. In fact, he continued to be able to speak Spanish, and as he was living in Oxnard, he saw a group of Japanese people in a community, and he was just appalled at the lifestyle and the morality, or the immorality, I should say. And he decided that he was needed to become sort of like the savior, and he was preaching on soapboxes. I can't imagine him doing that, but he did that. And he started uh, Boy Scout groups, and he decided that the Japanese were really going down the tubes in a bad way, and we had to raise up our standards and so forth. And as he started doing this, he got very interested in uh, working for himself. Eventually, my mother came over. They were married in Japan. She came over, and uh, they started a family. But by this time, they decided they would go to Southern California in Hollywood. He was still interested to set up a publishing firm, but there was a big earthquake in 19... 23 or so, and he lost all of his money in the earthquake. So he had to go out and earn a living the fastest way he could, and he saw these people who were Japanese guys gardening. He said, I could do that. I have a little car. And so he went around and started gardening in Hollywood. During even the Depression, he had a job because in Hollywood, there was always somebody in the movie industry who could support a part-time gardener or some of the big estates you had a full-time gardener for your estate. Anyway, so I was born and raised in Hollywood. And I was the youngest of eight children. And, oh, 1941, when the war came along, there were six of us surviving children of eight. And we lived in Hollywood. My father owned his house. Of course, it was in my two uh, oldest brothers and sisters' names. My oldest brother tells me that my father not only had the house in their names, he had the bank account. And he used to go to school, my brother George, and brag to the other children how he had $200 in his bank account. And this was in the 1930s. Well, the teacher accused him of lying. Oh, no, he said. He went home, got the bank book, brought it back, and there it was. Bank book, $200 in George's name. Well, I guess that happened more and more. And as time went on, my father became very much involved with organizing the gardeners because the gardeners themselves were undercutting each other to vie for jobs. Uh, people were taking advantage of them. There was still very heavy anti-Japanese, anti-Asian feeling. And so he became a, not a union organizer because they never had a union, but he got neighborhood groups and associations that eventually became a federation. And as a result of that, there were some controls and they had a means to get some protection and negotiating power with City Hall. So there was already a lot of things going on in terms of Japanese Americans going into um, civic responsibility. 1941, I was in the second grade, first, yeah, second grade. And when December 7th came along, I, can, I was not a reader, really, but I remembered there was a lot of agitation. That time, I was attending an elementary school called Los Feliz Elementary School in Hollywood. 
and second grade. Many of the children's parents were in the movie industry, so there were actors, movie stars, people in production, and so forth. The children of these people were my classmates. One of the children was Mary Frances. Mary Frances and I were the very best friends. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and we played together all the time. We didn't live near enough to go to each other's houses to play, but we were separable on the school ground. Somewhere around December 8th, she had to come to me. Now, in retrospect, I think this was a very painful thing, and yet she did what her mother told her to do. She said, Rachel, my mama told me to tell you that I'm not allowed to play with you anymore because you're Japanese and we're at war with Japan. Well, I understood the first part. I was Japanese, and I had some of that feeling from other children from time to time that I didn't look like them, I didn't have the lifestyle and so forth. But she made it very explicit, the part I didn't understand with, well, what did the war have to do with the fact that I couldn't play with her? So life went on and we were kind of at odds, I guess, until after Christmas, Christmas break. She comes running up to me and says, I want you to come and see what I got at Christmas time. And I said, oh, but you're not allowed to play with you. Me, your mama said, and she says, oh, she won't know. She works children's hospital or whatever hospital it was. And she says, and I have a key. Well, that was very impressive because a latchkey kid in 1941 was very rare. We didn't have a key to our front door. I don't think we ever locked the front door. Nobody I knew had a key to their front door. Anyway, so she says, come with me after work. So we go to her house, we sneak by the hospital, paranoid as we were, the mother's looking out the windows, we were sure. We get to her apartment. Now this is the other thing. I lived in a working class neighborhood where we all had little houses. She lived in an apartment. To me, people like Myrna Loy and uh, people in the movies had lived in apartments, so I was very impressed. We go in the front door, but I never found out what it was she was going to show me because Uncle Bill is coming in the back door. And she says, Mary Frances, who are you talking to? And she says, nobody, Uncle Bill. And she says, hide behind the sofa. Well, I felt really stupid because you don't do that with grown-ups. You don't try to fool them. But I wouldn't know what else to do, so I hid under the sofa or behind it. And he comes into the living room, looks behind the sofa, drags me out, humiliated, embarrassed, and he tells me to go home. He's not friendly. Go home and don't ever come back. And Mary Frances, I'm going to punish you. Terrible. Terrible, terrible feelings. So I go home. And I remember between then and when we left for camp ever really playing with her much, the teacher had given us, given me a surprise going away present. She was a um, very nice lady, probably an um, old maid school teacher, Miss McClure, and she had everybody bring me a present. And to this day, I can remember the presents, specific presents that those seven-year-old children brought me. And Mary Frances was one of the children that I selected to be in this group snapshot that uh, Mary L has. And so here we are sitting there on these benches and Mary Frances is sitting in the next to me and all these little children who were very good friends. Three years later, when I came back from Heart Mountain Camp, 1945, now th we went away in May of 42, 45, I came back to the same neighborhood, the same house, the same school. And the first day of school, we were really frightened to go back to school because we'd already had the experience of uh, children making fun of us, spitting on us, beating us up, calling us terrible names. So the first day of school was going to be a real hard thing. But fortunately, again, another teacher who was on yard duty did a wonderful thing. And I must say the teachers at the school were very sensitive, showed a great deal of leadership. The teacher came to the front gate where I was coming in. She had some children around her and she called me by name. She was not going to be my teacher, but I knew who she was. And she welcomed me back and gave this little speech, which made me feel very um, 
embarrassed, but it made me feel safe. It was also an indication for the other children that it was safe to play with me. The war had just ended. The bomb was dropped in August of uh, 45, and this was the first weekend in after um, Labor Day, uh, 1945. So things were pretty exciting about the war ending. Mary Frances was among the children there, and she came up to me, the only little girl who came and took her hand in mine in friendship. She didn't say anything, and I, I, I like to use the message to children who are, oh, 10 years old, who are in the fifth grade, who come to see us uh, do the Time of Remembrance, to say she didn't say anything, but she spoke volumes because she showed her friendship in a way, and she spoke out. You know, there's a wonderful, um, mural at the History Museum here in Sacramento, and one of the words that's on the Constitution wall is speak, and it's in relief, and it comes out in three dimensions. And I point to that to the children, and I say, that was something that Mary Frances did, and she didn't say a word. She just came up and took my hand. So I use that as a, an experience. But I think that the teachers really showed a great deal of leadership in that period. So I remember pretty much before, during, and after as a child in that whole experience. I don't remember how the family reacted specifically to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. All I can react to was the generalized fear, particularly from my mother. Um, my father was out of the house a lot. He was eventually picked up by the FBI and interrogated and so forth. And he, so he didn't have much of an opportunity to talk to us. But my mother was the one that we younger children were uh, close to. And she was the one who generated a great deal of anxiety in herself and, uh, of course, onto us. The fear for her was she had already lost two children to illness. Um, many years before, her concern was for the children. She had three teenage boys. Would they have to go to war? What would happen to the girls? Uh, it was always what if and what if, and she didn't speak English. So not being a person who could get the information readily, the paranoia, the fear was really, really magnified. She was very worried about the fact that the boys had BB guns. Uh, they did target practice, so there was guns and ammunition in the house. The boys didn't think that that was going to be any problem. She was the one who felt responsible to get rid of the bullets and try to hide things and so forth. Um, she filled us with stories about uh, that would scared us about what would happen to us. We didn't really know. Where were we going? We didn't really know that either. I think all the families were told that we had to be prepared to leave. Well, to me that wasn't a big deal except that it was exciting in a sense. My sister and I, who's, I was uh, seven and a half, my sister was nine, we went out and bought um, suitcases, two, one each. They were little suitcases made out of cardboard. In fact, we got them in the dime store. That was pretty exciting. I mean, the excitement for a while overrode my mother's anxieties. She was having to make decisions about what to take, what to leave, where to hide things. In Japan, we hid everything, apparently. Um, there were probably lots of arguments. The boys were trying to find ways to prevent us from going. Two of them were in City College, and one of them tried to join the National Guard and the State Guard, and he was turned down. Um, so people were taking things into their own hands by this time. The police were asking for our um, cameras and radios and so forth. Now, all of that was done on the honor Basis. I mean, the police didn't come around like they did in Europe and other places and pick up all this stuff. You had to take it in yourself. So there was a, a lot of frenzied activity. In the meantime, because our cameras were gone, my mother asked a very close neighbor if she would take some pictures of us children, the two girls, the two youngest children. I think her fear was that because she had already lost two little boys and on one of the children who 
that she had no photographs of when he died when he was four. She wanted to make sure she had photographs of us two little girls. So she had several of us, uh, of the pictures taken just around the house. So I remember things like that when my father was picked up. Um, he had already heard about various people being taken away. Some we didn't hear about where Mr. So-and-so went. My father had a uh, canvas overnight bag with a change of underwear and shaving gear and so forth hidden right next to the uh, front door so that when the FBI came, he all he had to do is pick that up and, and go away. Now, my father was a landscape gardener, and he was gardener to the Japanese consul. And he was also a very active in the Episcopal Church, Japanese Church, and he was a very active organizer with the Gardeners Federation. So all those things made him a target of the FBI especially the fact that he was a consul gardener. Uh, in fact, he was at the consulate when uh, the FBI came and they sent him home. They didn't pick him up then, but they came later to the house. And I remember the FBI guys coming to the house. And in those days, they had these fedora hats and they came and my father went away with them. Now, he's, he spent the evening, he did not uh, have to stay with them. But he said, and uh, this is a strange story, he said, well, they said I could go, I think. We said, well, what do you mean? He said to them, because the agents were talking to a number of men, he said, I have to go home because tomorrow's a work day for me and I have to see to my family. May I go home? And either to shut him up or to put him off, the FBI agent who was talking to made a uh, sign like this. Well, was that goodbye or wait, stay, whatever it was. My father said, I took that as an interpretation to go. So I left and they didn't come back after him. So he didn't have to go away. But it was a time of fear and unknowing. The fact that by the time we did go away, things really were getting very spooky. Even though we were told we were going to take a long trip. Hadn't been on a long trip. We had a car, but we, we never went on any long trips. I think when we left the house for the last time with our neighbors, the same lady who took the pictures, and she took us to the uh, meeting place where we're going to get on the, the buses to go to camp, I was still excited, anticipation, and it was going to be okay thing. It didn't know that I was going to leave all this behind. The shock came, I think, when we got to this place, the camp, which was a holding camp, Pomona, and we were all going to sleep in the same room, all eight of us, and we had to um, stuff these canvas mattress bags, or whatever they were, with straw and hay, and I had asthma and hay fever. And I also was having a reaction to the typhoid um, shots that we had to have, so I was not feeling good. All that was really very spooky, and then the fact that there were soldiers around. Now, we didn't have guard towers at that point, but there were soldiers around, um, and we didn't see any more of our friends. I started getting very homesick. We stayed that way for three months, and then after that, we heard rumors that we were all going to go somewhere on the train to our final destination. Again, they didn't tell us where we were going. We went on a train, which was kind of exciting again, but it turns out it was going to be three days and three nights of sitting up because there was no place to lie down. And what I remember of that trip was, again, a feeling of, um, really sadness, grief, desolation. But I fantasized as we went through the wide open spaces, the military police would come through the cars and tell us as we were coming into even small town stations to lower the shades in the windows. And then when we passed the little stations, we could raise them again. But at night time, I would look out the window and I would fantasize that I was riding the streetcar down Hollywood Boulevard and now I was at the 
this uh, corner, now I was at that corner, now I was at Vermont Avenue, I'm getting off and I'm going to walk six blocks to my house and now I'm going up all these stairs and now I'm going into the house and of course I was not in my house. And I did this time and time again and I think that's when I started this business of separating that I wasn't going to go home. There was another uh, sensory thing, memory that I have, and that was there was a teenage boy, and I don't know who it was, maybe it was even my brother who plays the um, harmonica. This teenage boy was playing Ravel's Bolero, and that monotonous song going on and on and on with the clickety-clack and so forth. Every time I hear Ravel's Bolero, it reminds me of that trip. When we got to Heart Mountain, again, it was a new atmosphere, a little bit of excitement. But I think this is where the real grief set in, where we were so desolated, so isolated. Um, heat and sandstorms. I cried a lot. And I can remember the crying because my mo I, in retrospect now, I think I was a pretty bratty kid. I probably made my mother feel very bad because she would be the first one I went to as a seven or eight year old saying, I want to go home, why can't I go home and cry, cry, cry. And she'd say, there's nothing we can do, we have to, to stay here. Um, so those first few weeks were very hard, even though the little friends we had met earlier were still with us in the same uh, living area. I think that separation from the home that I loved the routine, I was with my mother, father, all my siblings, and yet I have never been so homesick or sad in my whole adult life. And I've lived as an adult in foreign countries, all by myself, got to a new city, didn't know a soul, but I have never experienced that sense of separation and loss. And it was almost like that was so great that I can never experience anything so bad. After a while, things got better. And in camp, things did get better because the grown-ups, I suppose, made life easier for us. We had Halloween parties. We had uh, Thanksgiving. We had Christmas. And it's those childhood things about the camps that um, I remember very well. One, one experience I didn't recall, but I was told about later on, actually I read it in a master's thesis of a person uh, who said that first winter when it went down to 30 below, the guard, the military police and the guard towers were instructed to arrest anyone who went beyond the barbed wire. We did not have a legitimate pass. Well, 32 little boys went beyond the barbed wire to go sledding on pie tins, on um, cardboard boxes, whatever they could get. They had lifted up the bar uh, barbed wire and gone beyond to go out where there's more space. And the military police arrested 32 little boys. Now the oldest was 11. They made this as a point of education that all children, all people were not to try to escape because if you do, you're going to get arrested. Well, I mean, the fact that they took these little kids and did that scared the other children and word got around very quickly that these policemen, these military guys weren't kidding. And this is, I think, one of the early things that we learned right away. This was prison. This was not a fun camp. This was a terrible place to be. But there were other things that grown-ups had tried to do for us. I think the Christian groups had tried to contact other outside Christian groups, and they sent oh, uh, gifts so that we had at least one wrapped gift. And there would be some declaration on a thing about, oh, this is a, a toy for a 12-year-old boy or something for a six-year-old girl. So we had at least one gift to open. And of course, in our part, then we were to write to that child and say, thank you very much. And then you did a correspondence thing with um, a pen pal. The one I remembered was 
Ida Ortiz from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I don't remember her original gift, but a subsequent thing after we sent letters back and forth was she sent me some sugar cookies. Now she would have had to gone without um, butter and sugar because all that was ration. And she sent them to me in a little cardboard box about the size of little note um, cards. And when I got them, there was a hole in one corner already eaten out, opened it up, and apparently there had been mice in there because the cookies were now crumbs, almost no whole cookies, certainly not any whole cookies, little chunks and lots of little debris and lots of mouse droppings. When I tell the story to the children already, their faces are beginning to look a little ooh. And I say, and how many of you would have eaten the crumbs out of those co cookies? And they're saying, ooh, and I said, I did. And then I tell them, the reason that I'm telling you this story is because when you're under such deprivation for a long period of time and you haven't had anything so good, even this is too good to throw away. So you blow it off, you wipe it off, and I ate those cookie crumbs. Well, anyway, that was one of the things that I remember and it really is a story of le a lesson in deprivation and pretty soon your standards change, your behavior changes. So if you see anybody doing something a little bit different, you have to think about, well, maybe they're going through some difficult times. There are a lot of things that children had to do without. Imagine all these black tar paper bags, hundreds of them, one after the other, there's no break, there was no flowers, no greenery, no trees, and, and so forth that first year. And we also had nothing really to play with. There's no playground equipment, no schools, no movies. All this had to come piece by piece after a period of time. But we had to make do with things. My sisters and I played school a lot. We played library a lot. One of the reasons I wanted to become a librarian, of course, and never did, was because we had uh, a date stamp that we fit on the end of our pencils, and you could date stamp a book in. Wow, that was big stuff. Then I made a Monopoly set. Even at age eight, I was an expert in Monopoly. I knew all the real estate, the colors, the rents, Houses, no houses. We made everything. Of course, the making of the thing was the fun part. Playing with cardboards, handmade stuff was not so good. Even if you had 52 playing cards and we had fun making those, it's very difficult to shuffle cardboard cards. A real challenge came when we were making checkerboard. Well, we knew, you know, black and red and so forth. Well, how many squares do we put on it? We had to laboriously figure it out. We had two rows, this and that, and multiply it out. We finally figured out 64. So anyway, after we did all this, then what? So we really had to be very resourceful. And over a period of time, I think there were people in the camp who were very wonderful to us. We had a fifth grade teacher. The teachers came from outside, they were Caucasians. Many of them were from religious backgrounds whose organizations uh, stimulated them to come. Our fifth grade teacher uh, was particularly um, motivated to, to work with us. And after we got out of camp since 1945 until the present time, 2006, there are several of us who are in communication with her and she has come to California about five times. She meets with us, uh, we share information, and um, we continue to see each other. Now, the first time she said she was coming to Sacramento, she wanted me to meet her at the Greyhound bus station. I had not seen her since 1945, so she's coming about like maybe 1990. I don't know that she would have known what I look like, I certainly did not know what she looked like, so this was a real challenge to meet her at the bus station.
well, we linked up because I was the only Japanese person at the bus station, so I guess she took a chance and came up to me and asked me if I was Reiko. So anyway, these things that we started 60 years ago, those relationships have continued to go on. As my siblings left camp, the older ones, Two of them went on to University of Wyoming. One became an engineer and a physicist. The other one became a physician. Um, the sister, the older sister went back to, uh, after we got back to California, went to City College, then UCLA. She did not finish there. Then my sister and I, who were in our, um, let's see, 11 and 13, I guess, when we came back, did college prep classes for the most part in uh, junior high and high school. I had already decided, I think when I was in junior high school or middle school, that I wanted to go in some field of health. And I think that the reason for that was whoever I saw as a model. I think we all had wanted to be teachers, people in the library, and then for some reason or other, we had some health problems. We had to go to the doctor's office. And there I saw what nurses and technicians did. And I got very interested in the science of all these things. Interestingly enough, in the school that I went to in Los Angeles, the teachers, and I took mostly science and uh, language classes, the teachers were, in a sense, preparing us for going to college. When it came time in the eighth grade to decide what languages to take, we had on offer French, Latin, and Spanish. We were suggest we were told don't take Spanish because if you're planning to get a PhD, at that time Spanish was not one of the languages acceptable by the University of California <laughs> as a doctoral language. Well, I don't know whether it wasn't or not, so we stayed away from that because you want all the opportunities open to you. I took Latin because I was going to go into some kind of science. And later on, I took French in high school, so I, I took those concurrently all along. About the time I got to high school, I had found out that UCLA now had a school of nursing. That's where I was going to go because I knew that from little kid on, my parents expected all of us to go to the university. My mother had had a normal school education. Now they were born in 1890, my parents were, but my father went to university. My mother was raised in a um, Church of England convent school, and then she went on to normal school, which was like teacher's college, so they were very well prepared for their generation. But they had built into us, there's this normal progression from this to elementary to high school to city college. We didn't go into university right away because it was too expensive. And then if you got in through city college, then you could go to the big university. Well, by the time I got to high school, UCLA was there for me as a school of nursing. Then I knew that I had to get all A's to get into that school. Th so the pressure was really on for the college prep and all that. So by the time I got into the, my senior year, it was very well known that my grades were really going to be good. So I knew even before graduation that was accepted and I had it made in the shade and um, there were a group of us who were going to go to UCLA at the same time. Now th this was really continuing education because a lot of the same kids that I went to UCLA with were kids that I started kindergarten with. And for me, after I got uh, through UCLA, I had a very uh, unique dean of the School of Nursing who took an interest on her students. And she was the one who uh, would call me up and say, Dr. So-and-so is looking for a research nurse. I want you to go and interview for that position. Or Mrs. So-and-so is coming from the United Nations, and I want you to go and interview with her. Well, there was no way that I was going to be eligible for 
the United Nations, but anyway, she'd make me go through these exercises. But she was always looking after each one of her students. She also was the one who said, ah, the United States Public Health Service has money for nurses to get their master's degrees. Now you get over here and sign up for that. So we had a mentor in the Dean of School of Nursing, so I got a master's in nursing. After I got that, I decided I hadn't seen anything, I hadn't done anything in my whole life. What would I like to do? I wanted to travel, I want to live overseas, not just go to somewhere for two weeks. So I started looking for a way to work overseas. Well, since I wasn't eligible to do much in nursing, not having any teaching experience, um, I decided I could go as a clerk. So I applied for a clerk typist job with the federal government. And the, the lady who was reviewing the application said, oh, you're way overqualified. Why don't you apply for a nurse position with a medical division? I said, I didn't know you had one. So she again encouraged me this was April of 1959, and I went to Washington, D.C. on a telephone call, and I was hired on the job. Now, this was for a public health nurse to go to work in American embassies in probably the least developed countries in, in, Ameri in uh, the world. And the rule at the time was you go where there's an opening, where you were assigned. Well, of course, I would like London and Paris and Rome. <laughs> well, no. I was offered Cambodia, and I said, well, I guess I'll take it. I had no idea where Cambodia was. I thought it was in Africa. So I said, I'll take it. Then when I found where it was, I was a little concerned, being Japanese and knowing that Japan was there during the war and maybe they were not so nice to Cambodia because I knew that they were not very good in uh, the Philippines or in Malaysia. Well, the director of nursing assured me that they would not send me to an unsafe place. They would not send me to the Philippines, certainly not to Malaysia and Singapore. Cambodia was okay. That was the only country that did not ask for reparation from Japan. So that's how I got to be an American embassy nurse <coughs> in Cambodia, where I stayed for two and a half years. And then I was, uh, I took another tour of duty in Cairo. And that was an entirely different kind of atmosphere altogether. But I decided that I would not want to stay in the Foreign Service. It was not very challenging. And I decided that because my mother was also ill, uh, I should come back to California and maybe now that my horizons had widened to look at international development, that I would go into the sociology of change in developing countries. So I went to uh, Berkeley. This was a PhD program, and again, the dean of the School of Nursing at UCLA had written to me and said, now the National Institute of Health has money for PhDs for nurses to go into uh, academia. So again, I had somebody kind of looking out for me, guiding me, being a mentor at all times. So I went to Berkeley. I think in the long run for our family, World War II, the internment experience, and what happened to the family reflects sort of what's going on with the rest of other ethnic groups, but especially Japanese Americans, and that is that so many of our people almost up to 80%, depending on what study you look at, are marrying out. So you have interracial, intercultural, interreligious uh, mixtures. And part of that may have been because we came up through so much racism as we were growing up, and certainly during the war years, there's a tendency to to deny your own culture, to deny your own race. Well, there's not a whole lot you can do about your face if you're Japanese, or your color if you're a, a darker person. Um, but you can certainly choose maybe the person you marry or the family that you're going to have. In our family, we now have 10 people who are of the Jewish faith mixed uh, with 
Iraqi Jews and Romanian Jews, and the rest of us are nominal Christians, I suppose. But there are other things, too. When you talk about identity and how early on you start losing or wanting to lose that identity, and I think back again to my years in the camp. When I was 10 years old, I got onto this thing about movie stars. Well, I was raised in Hollywood, so we saw movie stars. We lived among them. We played movie star hopscotch. I wrote to the movie stars that I really liked, like Rita Hayworth, Tyrone Power, Betty Davis, all those people. And I'd say, I saw your latest film. Please send me an autographed picture. And I signed my name, Virginia because I didn't want them to know that I was Japanese and that I was living in a camp. Well, of course, the address is a strange thing, and then my name, the last name, was a giveaway, I suppose. But I got all these pictures, and I think there were about 68 of these photographs from various people, all saying, to Virginia, best wishes, or whatever it was, sincerely, Betty Davis. So I had this collection. Oh, when I was in college, I acquired a British pen pal, and she was crazy about American film stars, as she called them. So I said, oh, you can have my collection. So I sent her all these photographs, and she went bonkers. She just loved them. But then she writes back, and she says, but who is Virginia? I just could not. I was so embarrassed that I would think that somebody would believe that I wasn't Japanese, that I never explained to her that I was Virginia. But that denial eventually comes around to, now I know who I am. Now I know the history. I understand my mother better. I understand my parents. Um, you know, why do the brothers act the way they do? Why did my mother and father argue all the time, one thing or another? So I know it's hard for little kids to go through things like that. And it's very, very miserable. Um, but I think you, what my parents gave me was uh, some kind of inner strength to be able, no matter how bad things get, and there's a word for that, gaman, no matter how bad things are, you have to deal with it, go through with it. Maybe you're not gonna do it so successfully, but you have to do it. Mm -hmm.